from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, out of Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel will provide this week's analysis of the cattle markets. Among other things, Daryl will share his latest outlook on beef production in the third quarter of the year and whether demand will be able to keep up with that volume. Then K-State's Bob Weber will review some of the primary topics in beef genetic advances that were highlighted at the recent Beef Improvement Federation virtual conference. Later, today's wheat harvest update featuring Extension Agricultural agents Shad Marston of McPherson County and James Coover of the Wildcat and Southwind Extension Districts in southeast Kansas. Plus more here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. listening to Agriculture Today. Once more, it's good to have you along with us for the Cattle Market Insight this week. We catch up now with Daryl Peel, livestock economist at Oklahoma State University, who is with us regularly here. Boy, Daryl, we'd like to put a positive spin on this, but you look back at last week's fed cattle trade, pretty rough going. Uh, Some of the pundits, though, are saying that these swings we've seen in fed prices have settled down some, so that might be something of a friendly tone. Your thoughts on that? Well, I do think some of the volatility will settle down a little bit. Um, You know, we've got our capacity back up on slaughter. We're kind of, you know, getting a flow. Uh, So we're sort of getting supply and demand in the fed cattle market back in balance. Unfortunately, they're balanced at a fairly low level at this point. We've still got a tremendous amount of fed cattle backed up in the system. That's going to be there, and that's going to be the the pressure on that market uh, through the summer uh, and into the fall. And so we're we're just going to continue to deal with that and hope that we make a little progress chipping away at that backlog in terms of our ability to uh, get some of these cattle slaughtered. How much of that progress was made this past week? What are the numbers telling us? Well, if you look at estimated slaughter for this past week, you know, 680,000 head would actually be 1.5% over the same week a year ago. Now, that's a little bit uh, misleading because it includes a large Saturday slaughter, and the large Saturday slaughter was in anticipation of the fact that the next Saturday is uh, July 4th, a holiday, and so they, you know, they always build in a big Saturday slaughter to try to make up for a holiday. Uh, so we're kind of not comparing apples and apples exactly. But the bottom line is we have capacity pretty much back online. And, uh, you know, if that slaughter numbers realized uh, the expected beef production for this past week would be 5.3 percent above the same week a year ago. So that's part of the problem in the in the markets in general. We've got a we've now swung to a situation where we have a lot of beef uh, on the market from a meat standpoint, as well as a lot of fed cattle backed up in these feedlots. Is there any way to confidently foresee when that backlog might clear? (laughs) It may be more of a shot in the dark than anything else, but (laughs) what do you think on that? Well, it is hard to say definitively. I think we will make, you know, some progress as we go through the summer. It's going to depend on things like Saturday kills, and and that's going to depend in part on what the box beef market is and what the packers' overall incentive is to push slaughter as hard as they can. But the bottom line is, it's hard to maintain, uh, you know, big Saturday kills indefinitely. Uh, you can do it for a few weeks, but at some point it gets difficult to do that. So all of that said, we may carry part of this backlog into the fall. And I think the final thing that will give us a chance to get caught up will be that little hole in fed cattle marketings that will be the result of the low feedlot placements in March and April. Mm -hmm. We won't get into that until basically about September and on into maybe early October. So by then we should get caught up if we haven't been able to do it before then. 
Speaking of boxed beef on the demand side, it does appear as if virtually all of that spike in boxed beef prices because of the pandemic has withered away. The market's uh, back roughly to where it was, and one wonders now if it will continue to sink lower from here. Well, I, I think there's a good chance of that because of the supply situation. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The choice box beef cut out this past Friday was 207.17. That's the lowest level since March 12th. So we've gone through this enormous spike. We're back down to that. Uh, but when you look at the fact that for the third quarter, which we're just about into now, uh, we're projecting about a 6% year-over-year increase in beef production. Uh, and again, that's these dynamics this year. First quarter was up 8%. Second quarter was down 14%. Now we're going to be up about 6% in the third quarter. I think there's a good chance that at some point we may push this choice box beef you know, down below $2 at some point. And I don't know exactly where that bottom will be, but it, there's going to be some pressure here after the 4th of July. So if this all plays out and, and abundant supplies plus waning demand come together, that does not obviously bode well for prices for a, a fairly extended time, does it? I think that's the challenge we face here, um, and obviously there's some uncertainty about that, but you know, once we get past the 4th of July, um, you know, we kind of go into the, the summer doldrums, if you will, and demand is actually a little bit weaker there for a while until we get close enough to Labor Day to think about uh, a little bit more holiday pull in that market. Um, you know, and, and as we go forward, we have some ongoing concerns uh, just due to the fact that the U.S. economy is in a recession, and that's probably going to weigh heavier on the market in the second half of the year somewhat. So uh, you're absolutely right. I think we're going to continue to see a lot of pressure from both the supply and demand situation certainly through the third quarter. And to add to that, something caught your attention recently, you say, Daryl, and that is a forecast out from the International Monetary Fund on the world economy. If we look at the broader scope of demand internationally, you say that's a rather unsettling set of numbers, too. Well, it's kind of sobering when you look at it. We're still modestly optimistic that the trade side of things will be, uh, you know, somewhat supportive. It may be one of the brighter spots in things. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. And so these latest IMF global economic forecast would have the overall global economy for 2020 on an annual basis down about 5%. Uh, that includes uh, several country breakdowns, uh, you know, such as the U.S. being down about 8 percent, Canada a little bit more than 8 uh, percent, Mexico about 10.5 percent. And uh, again, we don't know exactly how that recessionary pressure in those other countries, just like we will have it in the U.S., will weigh on beef demand as we go through the year. So, uh, you know, we're, again, cautiously optimistic for some help there. Certainly, we've trimmed back our expectations on uh, beef beef exports, for example. Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty, and and, uh, and and we just have to wait and see how this thing plays out. Well, let's talk of something that you wrote upon in a recent article uh, that is a very much a reality for a great number of producers out there in those drier areas of the Central Plains and the High Plains, and that is uh, the droughty conditions and the flat-out drought in so many locations. And, and you had some considerations for cow-calf producers in particular on managing through what would look to be an extended run of drought. You might talk about what producers can be thinking about in that respect, Daryl. You bet. You know, as we anticipate uh, a drought or a potential drought coming on, um, you know, I always encourage producers to plan ahead as far in, as possible. There are some things you can do to help manage through a drought if you start early enough. And, you know, it's human nature to sort of uh, just hope for the best. And, and that's a strategy, but it's a risky one, I think, to just say, well, it could start raining any time now. And, and that's certainly true. But at the same time, if it doesn't, the longer you go on, the less flexibility you have. So the sooner you start doing some assessment of exactly where you're at, this time of year is critical in terms of pasture growth and hay production. Um, and so we're, you know, depending on exactly where you're at, what's going on with that, what are your uh, 
um, you know, what are your inventories of that? And, and then from there, you can start thinking about if I do have to do something, what am I going to do? And in what order am I going to do those things? And, and what will be my trigger points to help make those decisions? Things like drought are obviously very stressful. Uh, they're very emotional to producers. And sometimes that can cloud, you know, your ability to make uh, a really, uh, you know, objective kind of decision. So the sooner you can sort of make a plan and put some triggers in there that will guide you through that process, I think that's very helpful. So, you know, if we get into the midsummer here, we're still in drought and, and it's obvious we're going to have forage shortages. You start thinking about things like, should I pull these calves off early and maybe move them into a dry lot or a backgrounding program, possibly sell them, but to get them off the cow, reduce her forage requirements and stretch what remaining forage I have. Those kind of things can be very helpful as, as a starting point, but you have to plan ahead and do it before you're totally out of forage. Otherwise, it really doesn't do you any good. So, so there's a whole set of considerations. I think the sooner you plan and think through those things, uh, the better off you can make yourself. And just quickly breaking down here a couple of the possibilities. You mentioned early weaning, supplemental feeding those calves. Culling cows that are open, that would be something else to consider. And the economics on both of those counts aren't too bad, considering everything. Well, it's certainly worth looking at. Yeah, I, you know, again, uh, if you're talking about spring calving cows, you know, you can do some early pregnancy checking. You've got some older cows that it, you probably can identify ones that were likely going to show up as culls this fall. You might want to go ahead and move those now. And, and, you know, seasonally, we've got some fairly strong cull cow prices right now, certainly stronger than they will be in the fall or even late summer if everybody else gets into uh, having to cull some cows. So the sooner you do that, the better off I think you can be. And, and so you can look at that. Supplemental feed can work. Uh, one of the things that may be an advantage in this drought compared to some droughts, and that is that uh, forage and hay may get short, but we've got very abundant feed grain supplies. And so you can do a lot with some limit feeding, uh, stretching uh, limited forage. Again, if you don't wait until you're completely out, uh, you can make a little bit go a lot farther with you know some sort of supplemental feeding program that's designed from a proper nutritional considerations and taking into account all of the implications of that, labor and management and other things, but there are some alternatives out there that can help a guy get through this drought situation. Again, the sooner you start, the better off you'll be. Give these due consideration, these contingencies, depending on uh, what your drought situation is. And Daryl, as always, we appreciate the comments and we'll talk once again in a few weeks. Many thanks to you. You're very welcome. He is livestock economist Daryl Peel out of Oklahoma State University. And we'll be back with more on agriculture today. This is the K-State Radio Network. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and our next guest recently spent quite a few days involved in what has become over the years a high-profile and highly important meeting on advances in beef genetics. The Beef Improvement Federation hosted its annual conference just a couple of weeks back, virtually, and we'll talk about that, as well as some of the topical matters that came up during that program. Bob Weber is with us, cow-calf specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and by the way, the new executive director of the Beef Improvement Federation likewise. So, Bob, first of all, congratulations on that well-deserved recognition. Well, thanks, Eric, and it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. And uh, yeah, I serve as the, the I've been uh, involved in BIF for, for quite some time, originally as a Breed Association staff member, in fact, and then during my time at Mizzou was uh, and through here at K-State, served as Central Region Secretary for BIF and just took over the reins here uh, in, in the last month um, from Dr. Jane Parrish. Jane's a uh, faculty member at Mississippi State and also a, a longtime participant and leader in NBIF. And, and Jane served for, uh, she did her five-year tour of duty. And uh, Jane did an outstanding job. And, and I'm, I'm just really delighted to be uh, able to serve BIF in this way and, and uh, look forward to, to helping 
uh, grow and continue to develop the offerings of uh, educational programs through BIF. Well, the Federation continues on in good leadership hands under your guidance. So, again, congratulations. And those who are not familiar with the BIF and its function, you might remind us of that, Bob. Sure, Eric. So the the Beef Improvement Federation is really an organization of organizations primarily. So it's uh, uh, an amalgamation of state or provincial beef cattle improvement associations, as well as breed associations. And so the the elected board of directors represent those various entities and uh, work together really to do a couple of things. One of the the main products of of BIF over time and BIFs, uh, I think we had our 52nd annual symposia and and research conference this year has been to, to develop guidelines for uh, uniform beef improvements, actually what the title of the book is or the document. Um, But the the mission is really to standardize record collection processes for beef genetic improvement. And so um, BIF's got a long record of being engaged in, you know, helping guide and direct genetic evaluation systems here in the United States and and globally. And uh, in fact, we're going to talk about the online conference, but one of the other major developments in the past year has been a transition from our traditional paper document for the guidelines or PDF document to uh, a a wiki document. So there's a a living, breathing online uh, guidelines for BIF. And um, if folks go to just guidelines.beefimprovement.org, they can go kind of peruse the document. One of the things that's been amazing is a couple dozen people every day come and visit the guidelines from all over the world. Hmm. Um, and so we're getting uh, um, some nice digital uptake of, uh, of one of our main work products. Excellent. The conference and symposium itself, though, because obviously of the pandemic, had to be conducted virtually. What was that like? Yeah, so um, back in, uh, I suppose it was probably late March, uh, early April, with all the the closures and, and cancellations for transportation, we did have to decide to uh, to cancel the face to face meeting, which has been the hallmark event in the U.S. But we decided, and our organization has talked for some time about how do we um, move into uh, the digital meeting space uh, a little more, and this kind of. Um, gave us a, a low risk um, opportunity to test the waters. And so over about a 45 day period, we went from a full face to face meeting to a completely digital meeting and uh, um, you know registration site. We use Zoom as our platform to, to deliver the conference and uh, it worked out great. Participation was good then. Um, actually, that was one of the, maybe the the biggest surprises to us was uh, the just the massive uptake of the conference. Mm-hmm. We had uh, at the end of the day fourteen hundred and forty five registrants. Uh, of course, we had a fair bit of uh, sponsorship from folks that have been uh, aligned with our mission for a long time. Uh, made the the conference available free of charge for attendees. And so we again we had fourteen hundred, just over fourteen hundred uh, registrants. About a thousand and fifty of those were from the United States, um, which means we had about four hundred international participants, and uh, those came from thirty six countries. Oh, so a great take! It was just amazing. Well, primarily, what we'd like to do today is ask you to convey some of the topical matters that were covered at this year's Beef Improvement Federation Conference and Symposium. What's new in beef genetic advances, if you will? Sure. So uh, kind of as maybe we'll just work through the the, the schedule a little bit. One of the things we did have to do when we made it a virtual meeting was kind of tighten up the schedule a little bit because we usually are face to face for two and a half, three days. Um, And so we kind of uh, whittled down the program a little bit. Two days really covered uh, what we classify as our general sessions, if you will. And both of those focused around kind of broadly sustainability issues. And so trying to help our attendees get a broader view of uh, the beef value chain. And so we had uh, Henry Zerbe with uh, Wendy's Quality Supply Chain. Dr. Zerbe works in uh, uh, coordinating and, and procurement of 
product into the Wendy's franchises and uh, so ground beef and other protein supplies. So we talked a little bit about sort of attributes of products and, and how their consumer demands are changing. Uh, we had uh, Sean Darcy, Sean's Director of Market Research at NCBA, talk about a bunch of the consumer research that they've been doing to understand uh, beef consumers and their changing demands and perspectives on our product. And so that was uh, both really, really good talks. I should mention all of these are available um, online at uh, beefimprovement.org slash schedule. Um, we have recordings of those Zoom sessions uh, broken up by speaker um, and the slides to go with them. So folks can go out and, and, and watch these uh, at their convenience. The second day got a little more focused on sort of the beef production side. A talk by uh, Clay Mathis. Uh, Dr. Mathis is the director of the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management at Texas A&M Kingsville. The King Ranch uh, Institute is, is broadly known as uh, kind of a, a systems thinking mecca for beef producers. And so one of the things that uh, we asked Dr. Mathis to focus on was, you know, really, how do we take sustainability principles and get those applied at the production level? And so he did a great job of this sort of uh, systems view or systems approach to understand um, the various decision points in our production system and how we might leverage some of those against some of the sustainability objectives that uh, we've collectively as a business kind of outlined. So that was an outstanding talk as well. And then, uh, and we won't go through through all of the rest of, we had uh, two days of our technical breakout sessions, which were condensed down to two hours. And they covered the range of uh, sort of new technologies in uh, genomics and sequencing, uh, retrospective look at some differences we observed in uh, um, utility of various ultrasound records, had uh, some good discussions from um, some of our colleagues uh, from international destinations. So we had a, a number of talks about genetic and genomic program implementation in Australia from uh, faculty at uh, University of New England and, and their uh, associated groups. We had a, a nice update on some immune function uh, genetic improvement work undertaken in, in Australia and, and, and more broadly. Uh, some of that work going on here in the U.S. and Canada as well from Christian Duff and, and Dr. Brad Hines. Uh, from Australia. Duff works for Angus Australia. Um, so we had a, a really nice international flavor sh- kind of sprinkled through the through the conference as well. And um, just encourage folks to go out and, and kind of peruse through the schedule and you can kind of cherry pick the ones you like and you know sit down with a cup of coffee in the morning or beverage of your choice and, and just spend, uh, spend some time with those talks. A very fruitful program. That's quite obvious, Bob. Was there one take home for implementation on the ranch that maybe really stood out to you from the technical breakouts or whatever, uh, an applicable thing that a producer would uh, actually potentially employ in their operations? Yeah, so that's a great, great question, Eric. And I think, you know, we continue to have a pretty rapid expansion in in the uptake of genomics tools. And those are now getting leveraged uh, across a range of sort of phenotypes and uh, applications. And so, Maybe the, the biggest thing is just to kind of make producers aware that we, we need to continue to develop our understanding and how do we implement those tools at the, at the farm or ranch level to make genetic improvement. And unfortunately, and, and although many of us work very diligently to try and distill the complexity out of uh, some of the new tools, you know, continue to grow your education and, and knowledge about genetics and genetic improvement. Um, and how some of these tools work will be very valuable as, as you move forward. And you can kind of be on the front edge and, and learn about it and figure out how to implement it can be very, very helpful. And one way to go down that path is to use all of the information that is archived on the website from this past conference and symposium. And it's at beefimprovementfederation.org. Thanks for the quick recap here of what is every year an outstanding program for the cow-calf producers. Heat stock, commercial, there's always something there. And Bob, congratulations once again on pulling this one off. Appreciate your time right here. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. He's cow-calf specialist Bob Weber of K-State Research and Extension, who's also now been appointed as the new executive director of the Beef Improvement Federation. See all of what Bob talked about right there and more from the conference and symposium at beefimprovement.org. And we'll return with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. 
For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. We're back now on Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you and with today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Update coming off of the weekend. We'll talk with two Extension Agricultural agents today, one in central Kansas, the other in the far southeast part of the state, starting with the story on wheat harvest progress in McPherson County, where Extension Agricultural agent Shad Marston has pulled together a few notes. Shad, thanks for joining us. Did you have any harvest interruptions over the weekend because of rains? No, we missed it here in our county, the rains uh, this weekend. Uh, so combines were going um, uh, all weekend, and, and that was a, a good good thing because we didn't have that that prior weekend before that. So you got a good several days of harvesting in consecutively, it sounds. How far along are you with cutting in McPherson County? I would guess the southern part of the county, we're 75 to 80 uh, percent finished with harvest, with wheat harvest. I think in our northern part of the county... Our wheat was a little bit behind, and we still have some catching up to do. But I'm guessing in the next three or four days we will be uh, finished up, and a lot of the farmers will be done today and tomorrow. Very good. Uh, What kind of yields have been coming in? What kind of test weights? We've been extremely pleased with our yields here in McPherson County. I think we've probably ranged in the 50s on up to the 70s and maybe a little bit better. Uh, I'm Probably going to say our county average is somewhere in the 50s and 60s. We've had some fields cut, some big fields quarters cut that was in the 65 to 67 to 68 bushels per acre, and that's uh, awful good for for our county. I remember when I was a kid, you know, if we had 33 bushel wheat, that was uh, that was a pretty good year, and we're we're exceeding that now. Our varieties are so much improved. And we're getting along, you know, really pretty good. So the test weights held up equally well, it sounds. You know, we had some really good test weights at the beginning. um, And then we had that rain on a Thursday that rained all day. And we had some problems uh, getting back into the fields. And our test weights have come down just a little bit. But my reports the last uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, they were still in the 57, 58, 59 range. Were these numbers exceeding expectations? Yeah, I I think they have. When we started planting our wheat last fall, uh, it was wet, and then all of a sudden it turned dry, and a lot of people had to wait for that ground to dry up, and then it was too dry. And uh, I have some pictures of our wheat plot in Mound Ridge on December the 20th, and you could hardly even see any wheat down the rows. Hmm. And we cut that last week, and... We probably averaged in the 60s on that 21 variety wheat plot uh, at the Golly Farm. Wow. I would just like to say that our protein levels are excellent this year also. Uh, We've had some 12 and 11 uh, numbers come in on the protein, and and I think that's kind of surprising for uh, that little bit of rain uh, that we had earlier in the harvest uh, that delayed us at three or four days of harvesting but our protein levels seem to be uh, holding strong, and I think that's a benefit also for some of the producers. Shad, thanks for the comments right here. We always appreciate the input. Thank you, Eric. That's Shad Marston. He's the Extension Agricultural Agent for McPherson County in central Kansas. Now we'll move on down to the southeastern part of the state and actually talk about quite a collection of counties and harvest activity there, which is pretty much all wrapped up. We're speaking now with James Coover. James is the Extension Agricultural Agent centering on crop production not only for the Wildcat Extension District, but most recently the Southwind Extension District as well. And some that covers Montgomery, Wilson, Labette, Crawford, Allen, Neosho, Bourbon, and Woodson counties in the southeast. So, James, you've quite a bit of territory to cover here. Harvest is all complete in your area, generally speaking? 
Yes, pretty much everything at this point has been brought in. And uh, here in the southeast, we, we as soon as we get the wheat harvest in, we start planting double crop soybeans. So mm-hmm. most of them are in as well, at least the ones who decide to go ahead and plant this year. You've a good summary here, you say, on yields and test weights and the protein content likewise for that general area. How did it turn out? In general, it actually turned out really well. And so the wetness of May, but then the dryness of June kind of worked out for the wheat. I mean, it was good to have the dryness in June because we had just enough soil moisture to kind of fill out the berries and, and finish doing its processes. It, and then the the dryness made the harvest a lot easier. Yeah. And sometimes we have in the southeast where it's delayed and there's a lot of issues. This year, not too many issues. So some of the yields in the area were actually a little bit more than I was expecting. I mean, some of the yields were, I don't know, 20 bushels or so. Some of the fields were all the way into the 40s, which might seem low for other parts of Kansas. But here in the southeast, that's really not that bad. That's just a little bit below our, our normal averages. Test weights were okay as well then? Yeah, so the test weights were good. I mean, the test weights were largely above 60 to 65. I mean, the lowest one I heard of was 58. And so, I mean, the berries, they they were big, and there wasn't a whole lot of trash in it or, or shriveled berries. And you say you have some protein numbers to share as well, James? Yeah, so our proteins were not great because... In southeast Kansas, it's hard to get good protein. So our proteins were around the mid-9s to mid-10s. Protein is a direct response to nitrogen. And here, just being saturated roots for so long, it doesn't. it's a hard time pulling in nitrogen. We have a lot of denitrification in this area. But just a response to that lack of nitrogen ended up with a slightly lower protein percentage. It's not terribly uncommon around here for that to happen. So in the final assessment, the quality of this crop, it wasn't overwhelmingly great, but it wasn't bad either? Overall, not terribly bad. One thing, though, was actually the fusarium. So we were expecting some pretty heavy fusarium earlier in the year. I mean, during flowering, it was cool, rainy, fusarium, head blight present throughout the entire area. And, I mean, we were kind of right in the middle of the hot zone of the fusarium. However, when it came to harvest, it wasn't even to be found. I I haven't heard of any fusarium because the fusarium, you know, it's the disease that causes the balmatoxin, the mitotoxin. But we didn't really find any of that. That's a terrific note, and appreciate the input, James, and uh, thanks for giving us a quick overview of the harvest in that eight-county region in southeast Kansas. Yeah, thank you so much, and you know, thank you for letting me speak. That's James Coover. James is the Extension Agricultural Agent specializing in crop production for both the Wildcat and South Wind Extension Districts in the southeastern part of the state. Today's Wheat Harvest Update for you, you're listening to... Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas 4-H, the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy at Kansas State, and the Beach Museum of Art are teaming up to offer a new program called Visual Thinking Strategies. Kansas 4-H Extension Communications Specialist, Aliyah Mestrovich C., says the social justice-themed series will target new and underserved audiences. Aliyah, you're working on another program in conjunction with the Community Conversations program, and this is kind of an add-on that brings arts and the community discussions to life. Yes, we are working with the Beach Museum at K-State and also the K-State Institute for Civic Discourse to bring the community, in addition to the Community Conversations series, and it's called Visual Thinking Strategies. Tell me a little bit about this. I know you're trying to bring the arts together with the conversation. Yes, it's kind of, um, it's it's an art-based 
narrative inquiry that um, allows for participants to be exposed to a series of different types of art and unpack what is happening in those pieces of art in a very civil way. So how can the art be used then to really get this message across and start the conversation? Well, we're wanting to bring in new and underserved audiences to this project in conjunction with ICDD youth facilitators that have already been trained in civic and civil discourse. So we are looking to do kind of a social justice themed series. And our partners at the Beach Museum will be helping us pick out different types of artwork that can depict different aspects of social justice related to race, gender, and other identity dimensions. So this is just kind of the starting of the conversation then? Because I I think art kind of impacts people differently. It brings out different feelings, different emotions. So is that kind of part of that? Yes, absolutely. It will evoke different feelings and emotions. And that's what we're really shooting for. There's actually kind of a, a way to go about doing this and different techniques that we can use. And it's very versatile and dynamic how we can use visual thinking strategies. We can use this as an icebreaker when we are doing a training or an event related to community conversations. We could also make this the entire workshop and actually unpack art and tell stories about our own lived experiences through this medium. So typically what happens is the facilitator will ask the participants a really open-ended question like, what's going on in this picture? And that allows for people to openly interpret and express themselves and share what they see. Then we ask them, you know, what do you see that makes you say that? So we ask for visual evidence, not just what they think. So that's a way for them to build kind of even their critical thinking skills around art. And finally, we ask them, you know, what more can we find here? And that indicates that just like when we're talking about societal issues that are really tough, that bring up tough conversations and even conflict, that there are multiple possible answers And this promotes flexible thinking. All of this ties into the principles of civic and civil discourse. Do you have an age group in mind that might be better suited for taking something like this? Well, right now, we are going to start by training our facilitators that are going to be in middle school and high school because they have already been through the Community Conversation Series, and we have a critical mass of young people that are ready to take on this challenge. Following that, we'll work with the Beach Museum to look at the age appropriateness of the different activities. But right now, we are aiming to target middle school and high school youth at the present time. One thing that might be good from the standpoint of being able to present this is the fact that this could be done virtually if it has to be. That's exactly right. Actually, we had our partner from the Beach Museum present for Discovery Days, actually. They have already connected with the Department of 4-H Youth Development, and we were excited to find out that we are doing community conversations together and that uh, visual thinking strategies is just one more component of building a more just and civil world. Is this something that should be taken in conjunction with the other community conversations programming, or is this something that could be done as a standalone program? Right now, where the facilitators are concerned, they are going through the entire series to be able to be trained to be using visual thinking strategies as a facilitation technique. We aren't far enough in the pilot yet to determine if this will be a standalone or not for participants because we're just in the process of beginning to look at training facilitators. You mentioned that this was an arts-based narrative inquiry methodology. Go into a little bit more detail. What what does that really mean, And I guess in just layman's terms? Arts-based narrative inquiry is a research methodology, and it really allows us to connect art and storytelling, and in this case, identity development. And so, you know, we we try to connect to our our values, our beliefs, and our behaviors through the medium of art and connect it to our lived experience. That allows us to build more understanding and awareness around our own selves, and in this case, our own cultural selves, and more awareness about the cultural selves of others that are different than we are. Do you have a time frame for getting the facilitation training started? 
Yes, we'd like to start over the next three to six months getting facilitators trained virtually or potentially in person at some point, and then begin to host some events in partnership with ICDD and the Beach Museum. Is this program being done anywhere else, or are you kind of leading the way with this effort? In our community, adding the youth development component to visual thinking strategies is something that the Beach Museum started to kind of entertain this idea over the past year. Connecting it with the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy is also something that has been happening over the last year. And so we are really just wanting to partner, collaborate, and really put this into action and get institutional buy-in with those three entities, 4-H, ICDD, and the Beach Museum. And with all programs, you're looking for this to eventually be across the entire 4-H spectrum. Yes, we are. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really wanting to take this statewide. We have applied for a grant recently to find some funding to be able to do that because we, we really think that this is a great way to reach more historical 4-H audiences, but also new and underserved audiences. It's a great way for a lot of people from diverse backgrounds to come together for the common good and have tough conversations that matter. That's Kansas 4-H Extension Communication Specialist, Alaya mestrovich C. To learn more about the Community Conversations Program, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.